Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So, with the coronation of His Majesty King Charles III, we were all reminded once again that nobody does pageantry and tradition like the Brits. Now, I'm sure everyone who watched the ceremony was in awe, as I was, at the sheer magnitude of the occasion. How amazing is it to think this same ceremony has been performed in the same location of Westminster Abbey since William the Conqueror was crowned king in the year 1066? Now, as an Australian, knowing that we have that connection to such deep, rich history through our British roots is really quite overwhelming. It is special, it is sacred, and we are all privileged as citizens of the Commonwealth to have such a link. But every party has at least one party pooper. Generally speaking, left-wing Australia has an issue with Australia's connection to the Crown and to Australia's status as a constitutional monarchy. And given the left's penchant for nonsensically tearing down anything special and sacred, of course the coronation was used by some to decry colonialism, etc, etc, insert lefty buzzwords here, and call for Australia to become ugh, a republic. So, as an uber-monarchist, arch-royalist, and renowned Anglophile, you may have gathered that I'm rather opposed to the idea of Australia becoming a republic. In fact, I find the idea repugnant, not least because there's, you know, no need, but also because the trendy cultural leaders of the Australian Republic movement and their various noisy lackeys in the media and on social media have, in my opinion, toxic ulterior motives. Exhibit A, the coronation commentators at Australia's publicly funded broadcaster, the ABC. Nothing showed how your ABC is really their ABC better than the way that they previewed the coronation of King Charles on the weekend. That they were at the heart of the dispossession of the stolen land of our First Nations people and of massacres and attempted genocide in this country and others. That's really important. The Australia with an Indigenous heritage, a British foundation and the migrant richness of the migrant experience is a lovely idea. I don't know where that Australia is. We haven't lived in that Australia. You know, they talk about genocide. You know, they talk about crimes against humanity, which they are now recognised as. But this may well be the start of a different Australia and the, the f end of the final element of the British Empire. As a result of the Crown establishing institutions here, Australia itself was founded, or at least New South Wales and the colonies, founded as penal colonies. So it's about time we absolutely start to imagine First Nations peoples at the front and centre of our nation. Um, you know, abolishing prisons, for one, because mm. those are also outdated in this colony. Now, before I continue explaining why Australia becoming a republic is a terrible idea, I need to clarify three things. The first is that in this video, I am going to be specifically discussing Australian republic enthusiasts who are on the left, not the right. While there aren't that many of them, there are a few conservatives in Australia who do favour the idea of a nation becoming a republic, God bless them, and look, yes, they have their reasons. However, those believers in a republic are not who I am referring to in this video, just so you know. The second thing I need to clarify for you foreigners out there is Australia's status as a constitutional monarchy. Constitutional monarchy is defined as a system of government in which a monarch shares power with a constitutionally organised government. The monarch may be the de facto head of state or a purely ceremonial leader and is, at least in the case of the British monarchy, a compulsorily apolitical presence. They are not allowed to express any political views or take sides. Which, to his credit, King Charles has done very well at since he became king. He has nicely reined himself in. The Constitution allocates the rest of the government's power to the legislature and the judiciary. In the case of Australia, the monarch, King Charles III, is the sovereign, who appoints at the instruction of the Australian government a governor-general, who is Australia's head of state and represents the monarch. The function of the governor-general is also largely ceremonial, but they do have the power to uh, make decisions about who is or isn't in government, if the government of the day is incompetent or corrupt. 
which, funnily enough, has happened before. More on that later. As such, while the monarch is the sovereign and the governor general is the head of state, the monarch and the governor general, by proxy, do not rule. It is very important that is clear because I noticed when Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II passed away last year that a number of uh, American commentators seem to think that the queen or king actually rules or has some sort of say in the everyday function of a uh, government. Hence the calls at the time for King Charles to organize reparations to former colonies. We can mourn the queen and not the empire. Yeah. Because sure. if you really think about what the monarchy um, was built on, it was built on the backs of black and brown people. She wore a crown with pillaged stones from India and Africa. And now what you're seeing, at least in the black communities that I'm a part of, um, they want reparations. You know, Barbados left, uh, left, the, uh, left the sort of this, oh this monarchy, this colonization. Yeah. Um, Jamaica, I'm, I have a lot of Jamaican friends, that's coming soon. And right now, Charles now is in a position, he's, I think, has 14 colonies that he is now head of state, including Australia and Canada, I believe, if yeah. I'm correct. It's time for him to modernize this monarchy. And it's time for him to provide reparations to all of those colonies. Now, of course, he can't do that because you know, he doesn't have any legislative power. Australia is a representative democracy and, for lack of a better term, a crowned republic. Given the crown has no say in making our laws and at most functions as a very occasional referee via the Governor General. Again, more on that later. Now third, when I say there is a push to make Australia a republic, I don't mean with an entirely new democratically sound system of government. The only models the Australian Republic movement have proposed so far are simply replacing the monarch with a president to perform essentially the same function. So replacing the compulsorily apolitical monarch and by osmosis the similarly apolitical governor general who attained their positions either hereditarily or by meritorious appointment with someone who is in some way elected and will therefore need to campaign, thus necessarily and inevitably injecting politics into an office that is supposed to be apolitical. Make it make sense. So, there are two types of left-wing Republican. The first is the old school Republican, moved to act by something I like to call Whitlam derangement syndrome. This syndrome is the intergenerational resentment harbored by those on the left who just cannot accept that sometimes their proverbial political team, in this case, former Prime Minister Gough Whitlam and his Labour Party government, makes mistakes worthy of reprimand. Therefore, they have been vaguely seeking to avenge Gough Whitlam's dismissal as Prime Minister by the Governor-General in 1975. Well, may we say, God save the Queen. Remember when I said the Governor-General acts as a very occasional referee when the government of the day is incompetent or corrupt? Well, that was the only time in Australia's history where it happened, and it has fueled old-school Labour Party enthusiasts for nearly 50 years with a bubbling, salty fury, the likes of which mere mortals cannot fathom. They were incensed that a foreigner could apparently meddle in Australia's political processes. Hell hath no fury like a lefty scorned, am I right? So you can imagine how disappointed they must have been back in 1999 when Australia did, in fact, vote in a referendum as to whether or not Australia should become a republic. And the result was obviously a resounding no. However, it turned out the crux of their lefty chagrin was unfounded when, in 2020, the palace letters were released by the National Archives of Australia. These were about 200 letters between the Governor-General of 1975, Sir John Kerr, who dismissed Gough Whitlam as Prime Minister, and the late Queen's then Private Secretary, Sir Martin Charteris. Now, far from being the smoking gun proving once and for all a foreign entity meddled in Australia's democracy, the palace letters revealed that, in fact, 
Sir John Kerr did not inform Queen Elizabeth before he made the decision to dismiss Gough Whitlam and that Sir Martin Charteris did not offer any encouragement for him to do so, acknowledging only that the Governor-General does indeed have reserve powers to use in this way and that they should only be used as a last resort. And yet still, these old school Whitlam deranged Republicans continue their crusade to make Australia a republic. Not for the betterment of the nation, because there is nothing about being a republic that would demonstrably make the nation any better, but because they have a 50-year-old axe to grind. Now, the second type of left-wing Australian Republican is the far-left identity politics opportunistic group and racial activists who, living in the alternative universe in which straight white cisgender men are just like so evil and oppressed like everyone, jump on the chance to tear down Western institutions. In the case of a republic, they insist the crown is a colonialist, racist oppressor and that in order to be free from this racial oppression, we need to become a republic. Independent senator, indigenous woman and bona fide lefty eccentric Lydia Thorpe gave the best example of this mindset at a protest last year after the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. The crown has blood on their hands! <laughs> has a major flaw. Insisting something is oppressing you implies that thing has some sort of power over you. The problem with this in relation to the British monarchy is that the Crown hasn't had any power to proverbially oppress anyone since 1689, thanks to the English Parliament passing the Bill of Rights. This established the doctrine of parliamentary supremacy, which meant that Parliament became the supreme source of lawmaking over the monarch and the courts, and described several abuses of power by King James II, the monarch of the time, as illegal. No more or divine authority of kings and queens to rule. It is this willful misconception about the powers of the monarch, or, you know, lack thereof, that old school Republicans and the identity politics opportunists have in common, and it feeds two of the main arguments as to why Australia apparently needs to become a republic. The first argument is that Australia should have an Australian head of state, and the second is that we need to be independent from the UK. As the left likes to say, let's unpack this. First, the argument that Australia needs an Australian head of state. As it stands, the monarch is generally regarded as the head of state, although, as you will have noticed, I have been referring to the governor-general as the head of state. You will see why in a minute. And some people find the notion that a foreigner is supposedly the proverbial head of Australia objectionable. However, this belief is misconceived. It's important to remember the only function of the king or queen, that is the sovereign, under Australia's constitution is to appoint and dismiss the governor-general. All other constitutional functions are exercisable by the Governor-General, who, remember, acts on the advice of Prime Minister and Cabinet, with the exception of said reserve powers I mentioned earlier to dismiss a government, and is not controlled in any way by the monarch as sovereign. In addition, the sovereign cannot exercise the constitutional powers of the Governor-General. Therefore, coming round about to the point, as outlined in The Spectator by the Honourable Ken Handley KC, who served as a judge on the New South Wales Court of Appeal for 22 years, so in other words, he knows his stuff, the Constitution does not, in terms, identify our head of state. It follows that he or she must be the person who exercises the functions of the head of state. This is the Governor-General, because the only power exercisable by the Sovereign is the power to appoint and dismiss a Governor-General. And, as we know, the Governor-General is, in fact, Australian. So, in summary, while Republicans lament the alleged lack of an Australian head of state, they are willfully overlooking the fact that 
we already have an Australian head of state in the form of, of course, the Governor General. Now, this has been upheld by the courts a number of times as far back as 1907. The more you know. The second argument is that Australia is somehow not independent from the UK. This is untrue. Aside from the Bill of Rights passed by the English Parliament in 1689, any remaining powers the monarch had over the Australian states were abolished by the Australia Act of 1986. We are well and truly independent of any nefarious wielding of power by the Crown and have been for, you know, centuries. So, with arguments one and two debunked, what are lefty Republicans to do? Well, in comes argument number three, identity politics. I guarantee you when it comes to the next referendum on whether Australia becomes a republic, which may be in the next three or four years, by the way, the big argument Republicans will push is that if you support the monarchy and vote no to a republic, then you are in fact a filthy racist. They will run with the line that Australia is apparently a racist, white supremacist, colonialist society under the boot of the crown, and that the only way to atone for our alleged racism and white supremacy is to become a republic. Now, this argument is much harder to cut through than the first two, because after all, nobody wants to be called racist. But the counter argument to Australia becoming a republic is really not hard to make. This isn't a simple matter of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Becoming a republic would be willfully introducing major and totally unnecessary political upheaval into our lives for the sake of sating a small number of activist historical grudges. It is a solution in search of a problem. It will not, in any way, improve Australia, and in fact, it will likely be to Australia's political detriment as it would fling the door wide open to the kind of political corruption and turbulence only seen in, well, republics. I mean, seriously, Australian Republicans, what are you aspiring to? France, Italy, Iraq, South Africa, Venezuela, or dare I say it, the United States of America? <laughs> Look, Americans, you know I love you, and you know I love your country. I sincerely do. And please don't throw me in the harbour with all the tea when I say this. But if you only stuck it out with the crown back in 1776, you might not be in the god-awful mess you're in now. Just saying. Constitutional monarchy works for Australia. There is nothing to be gained and a whole lot to lose if we decide to turf what is arguably the most stable system of government in the world for something that is untried, untested, and let's be frank, nowhere near as much fun as maintaining our connection to the crown. I will take King Charles III over Emmanuel Macron or Joe Biden any day of the week, let me tell you. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment. And if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my subscribe star link and other ways you can support me.